from the from the from the other. Everybody, uh, looks like uh, Tom's just going to get ready to start sharing his screen. Just, I'm ready, Fausto. I'm live. All right, all right, all right. Uh, let's just get, get this ball rolling. All right, so everybody, uh, welcome to Cybertrain University and uh, one of my really great, great friends. And I would even call him even a little bit of a mentor to myself, you know, is my friend Tom Sosnoff. Now, obviously, everybody knows who he is. Um, he's the founder of Thinkorswim, and he came out and launched Tasty Trade. But before we do that, um, and, I, and, we, and we do this quick intro and get him ready to start, uh, if you notice on the bottom right-hand side, everyone, in the chat, we are broadcasting this also live on Facebook and Twitter. So if you want to just take that link, I know some of you guys are in a couple of uh, chat rooms and Big, big trading rooms, just go out there and just share it with them so they can watch it. You don't have to log into this room to watch this video and it's being recorded for all your listening pleasure. Now, with that said, everybody, uh, regarding about Tom Sosnoff and Tastyworks, uh, mm -hmm. I know Tom for, geez, I can't even remember. It had to have been about 15, maybe 15 years ago. And we met up in Canada at one of the Traders Expos events that we've done. And over the years, you know, we became very, very good friends. I've done a lot of events with him when he was at Thinkorswim. I do a bunch of events. I was on his show on Tasty, on Tasty Trade a few times and also, which was always exciting. It was just so, and it's so funny. It's two New Yorkers against two New Yorkers just sharing how things work. But, you know, he, he, he actually, one of the big things Tom's always likes, which I have to get up there and get him some bagels. He's a big fan of bagels. So if you have an opportunity, drop him some off. He, he loves to eat just like all his Italians do. But not only that, but uh, just kidding aside, he's going to—he's a really great trader. You've seen him on on his show. He knows exactly how to you know call things out. And the reason why I want to have him on on Cyber Trade University is that listen, there's a lot of us out there that like options, want to know how to trade options. Um, but you know what? There's a lot of junk out there too. And you know, I can't talk for the haters out there and I can't talk for people that you know think they know how to trade options but you know what you know options is not for everybody for the purpose of th someone didn't teach them how to do it the right way and you got to know where to start the foundation of and everything else and that's what's great about his show he really kind of puts his money where his mouth is he definitely shows exactly what what's going on in an options play and you know what you guys always ask me what well, would you recommend as an option I, listen I'm a day trader. That's what I do. Okay. But I do do some swing trading. I do do some options when I have to, there's only one place I, have, I get my information from and it's from Tom if I ever had to. And so I pick on him once in a while. But, uh, but before the one last thing, I just want to remind everything about Tom because I hear about this all the time. Great traders think you need six, seven, 20 monitors. And just want to tell you something, a little thing about Tom uh, that I always learned about him. And I share this with everybody in my classes. I tell everybody this, they say, Fausto, how many monitors do I need to trade? And I'll never forget the first time I met Tom in his office, where he was sitting in the boardroom in front of all the traders in his room. I thought he was going to be in this big luxury, exciting, you know, corner room of in, in Chicago by himself, all glass, but he's not, he's a very hands-on guy. And I was shocked, but the biggest thing I noticed about him, he was trading on one monitor. And I want to pass this on to everyone, because I think this is very important, okay? Because we have a lot of traders out there that think they know how to trade. Uh, doesn't mean you should, but it's okay to try. But one thing, the biggest mistake people always say, and this is what, coming from his mouth, he always told me, and this always sticks out to me, and Tom, I think you're gonna appreciate this. If you can't make money with one monitor, how the hell are you going to make money with six? He always told me. And I'm like, you know what? That actually makes perfect sense. And ever since then, I knew I was going to hit it off with him. So with that said, listen, let me pass the mic over to him. Uh, Tom, I know you, you know, just finished your show, and just thanks for coming here again. It's always a pleasure having on Cyber Trade University. So enjoy. Sure. Hey, thanks so much, Fausto. And um, welcome, everybody. It's, uh, it's an awesome opportunity for me. I would do this every afternoon if I could. I feel like I do sometimes, but um, um, I, I love talking about markets and I love talking about uh, you know trading. And so um, here we are. Fausto, you feel please feel um, feel free to jump in um, anytime you want. I I I will take this conversation any direction that um, that you want. So you know, again, I'm excited. Do, do you have something specific direction you want me to go, or can I just um, riff off on on a bunch of different directions that I um, that I've kind of prepared for today just let me know if there's something specific that you want me to cover well you know Tom I mean obviously you know you, you know rip you, I know you got a plan you, you, you I don't want to mess up what you have uh, your game plan just one just one thing that 
my traders always, you know, in my room, always, always ask me personally, and maybe you could share your knowledge on that, is they always sure. ask me, you know, when is the right time to trade an option? Like, you know, specifically, you know, me being a day trader, you know, the, you know I always like to day trade to hedge myself or an insurance policy, you know, because I think that's what people, because the people starting to get a little nervous now. They're seeing this market, uh, you know, 28,000 and I'm having people ask me, you know, should I take my money off the table right now? And, you know, and I always kind of like to use an option play as an insurance policy and say, listen, you know what, if the market crashes, you know, there's no better thing than, you know, you're not going to just sell everything now. Maybe, you know, you don't know yet. Uh, maybe yeah. you should that, or, you know, maybe just explain to them a little bit, you know, how to find an option play because a lot of people don't know which option to trade. And one of the things we always do, and you probably see this all the time, um, you know, us being day traders, we just kind of focus on making a day's pay. You know, we find a stock yeah, sure. you know, up 200, 100%. And sometimes there's a great option play and they don't know where to look. So you know, basically those two things might help. And then obviously, you know, talking about the platform that you got. And I think that also has a, I think that's the number one big play people have to understand too, is like, sure. you know what, no matter how good you are, if you don't have the right software, you're not going anywhere. Sure. Okay. That's, that's great. I'll, I'll take it from there. And anytime that you want to jump in, you know, just feel free to, um, you know, interrupt me and to, to, to jump on in, you know, I, I'd appreciate the, the two way. So, no problem. so welcome everybody. And uh, again, thanks Fausto for the, for the opportunity. Yeah. Fausto and I go back um, almost two decades um, to the early two thousands when we originally built Toss and, and I met Fausto and, and it was funny. We, um, I, I think I've been surrounded my, I grew up outside of New York city. I think I've been surrounded my whole life with uh, Jews and Italians, and I'm unable to distinguish between the two, and um, and Fausto fit right into the uh, right into the mix. So um, so we hit it off a long time ago. Um, I, I have a one public service announcement to make, and then I'll get into my discussion. On the chat today, on the webinar, um, is our three people from from Tastyworks, so that I don't have to look at any of the questions. So when you send in a question, I actually won't see them. Um, and that way I can go forward and just give, you know, kind of a, an objective presentation and just keep streaming along. But the good news is Scott Sheridan, who is um, the co-founder of, um, uh, basically Scott and I have been partners since, since 1987 or something. Um, so we're over 30 years working together and Scott runs Tastyworks. Scott's on with Chris and Ryan and all three of those guys um, are, are on the trade desk and run Tastyworks, our brokerage. So no questions are off limits. You can ask them any questions about trading. You can ask them any questions about the brokerage firm. You can ask them any questions about the business. Um, everything is on the table today and they're on full time for the next hour with chats. So please feel free to, um, uh, to pick their brains and to write to them, you know, write, answer, ask any questions you want. And uh, then Fausto and I can concentrate on the, on the presentation. And I think everybody wins in that scenario. So Scott, Chris, and Ryan are on and uh, light those guys up and, and ask them anything. It's part of our culture is we are completely an open, open, you know, open book in that regard. We have an answer, ask us anything, you know, approach to this business. So I want to, I want to say one thing and then I'll get into the discussion of answering Fausto's question then about timing and then, and then give a presentation. Um, one thing I think is important and I, I, th I want to make this clear from the start is Although I grew up as an option trader in this business, and I'm going on close to the end of four decades now, um, and that's been my primary business, and, and I do trade about 80% of my trades. On, an, on this year, I'll make about 15, right around 15,000 trades, and all of my trades actually are, are displayed on, on this platform, which is kind of neat. So on the Tastyworks platform, we have something that's called a follow page. And in the follow page, you see all these people that actually work for us and we show all their trades because we're one of the few firms that kind of practice what we preach. And these are just an example of like a bunch of, you know, all the trades that I made today and you can scroll through them over the course. There's probably about 70 trades today, something like that. But over the course of the year, we make, you know, 15,000 trades or something like that. Um, what's, in, what's important about that is that about 80% of my trades are option trades, about 15 to 17% are futures and about two or 3% are stock trades. And that's the nature of, of our trading. My futures trades are about 50% futures and 50% futures options. So the way my breakdown really works is about 80% options, about 8% about futures, about 8% futures options, and about two or 3% stock. And that's just to give you an idea. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because 
I think it's important to understand there is no such thing as, in my eyes anymore, there may have been in the past, but now there's no such thing as a futures trader, there's no such thing as an option trader, and there's no such thing as a stock trader. There's just traders. And traders should be agnostic to product, and investors and traders should be agnostic to product, and you should trade where there's opportunity. And, and that's kind of gonna be the focus of today's discussion is, is looking for opportunity in the marketplace and trading where there's opportunity. The product you use is irrelevant, and the decision of which product to use is based on liquidity and capital efficiency. And that's a really important takeaway. Just remember the future of trading for individuals, for self-directed individuals in every, there's a few hundred people on this chat and there's probably a few hundred more people listening in at in, in various places. And I think the most important takeaway, and I lo love to give tons of takeaways. And the most important takeaway for starters is just to recognize that what will, what will differentiate us differentiate us in the future is a combination of know-how because technology is commoditized, pricing is commoditized, and content is becoming commoditized. So there is a level of know-how and, um, and then there's obviously a level of expertise and there's a level of know-how, but the real um, change over the next couple of years is just gonna be about capital efficiency. He or she who could be the most capital efficient, the most mechanical, and incorporate the most products. And the reason why products and strategy are so important is that's about diversification. People used to think, hey, if I just trade options or if I just use one strategy, I can become very proficient at that. But the reality is that is not the case anymore. Nowadays, with as efficient as the markets are and without, with as theoretically efficient as the markets are, in today's world, you have to be able to apply different strategies you have to be able to apply different underlyings. You have to be able to apply different volatilities, which is also important. And then lastly, there'll be different durational cycles. So in other words, you might use 30 days, you might use 45 days, you might use 60 days. And I don't care whether you're a swing trader, a futures trader, an option trader, whatever it is, all of those differences, volatility differences, durational differences, strategic differences, and product differences all come into play. And they are all super important for success and then the underlying theme over the next couple of years and over the next couple of decades actually will be about capital efficiency. So that's where I'm gonna start this discussion. Now, Fausto asked a question, which I think was really good and it was talking about timing. And in the old days, you know, back whenever, and, and I'm talking about when dinosaurs, you know, I started on the floor of the, CBO, of the CBOE in 1981, I think. I could have been 80, but it may, I think it was 81. And I, I stayed in there for 20 years and then moved on to build Thinkorswim and then to build Tasty Trade and Tasty Works. But my, it, throughout my entire career, I used to think there was different times of the day when there was obviously more opportunity. Like the first hour, there's noticeably higher volume. The last hour, there's noticeably higher volume. But part of the reason we used to think it was more advantageous to trade when there was noticeably higher volume was because, um, because you could get more stuff done and the markets were more efficient. Because, you know, obviously it was a individual slash market maker industry back then. Today, everything's done with um, computers and price discovery is done with high frequency market making, which means that on the technology used specifically, this is the Tastyworks platform that, that Scott and I um, built and released in 2017. It's the latest piece. It's the newest piece of technology on the market. It's an absolutely beautiful software platform and it's the only um, retail trading platform that's built on high frequency middleware. So the marketplace is a high frequency marketplace and our technology is high frequency middleware. All the other platforms out there, you know, like TD Schwab, E-Trade, Fidelity, they're, they're all legacy platforms. Nobody's built on high frequency infrastructure except Tastyworks. So Tastyworks is noticeably faster and it has lots of different types of functionality. But the neat thing about high frequency technology today, and this is the, this is the real takeaway, is that price discovery is now done for you on the technology. So in the old days, like if I wanted to place an order and I wasn't sure what price to put it in at, like a spread or an option or, or something else, or you know some kind of like a covered call or something, yeah, and you'd have to put it in below the market and then move the price around and do all this kind of stuff. You don't need to do that anymore. The technology today does all the price discovery for you. And it basically shops the order to all these high frequency market making firms 
before it ever even hits the um, floor of the exchange. So the order flow today gets price discovery done internally inside the software. So you almost always get the best price available and you don't have to worry about it, which is a huge savings of time. So the focus today, and, and when I mean today, I just mean the focus overall for trading is you need to stay small, you need to trade often because law of large numbers is critically important. Um, so it's one, it's about law of large numbers, two, it's about diversification, and three, it's about capital efficiency. Now, what I'd like to do today, and Fausto, I think this is kind of a, um, a good discussion topic, is I would like to talk about trading in, um, two, in, in November, end of November, 2019. So I don't want to talk about, you know, trades that we could have made a year ago or trades that we might be able to make next year. I'm extremely bullish on what, on the opportunity that's going to be available to us over the next year. I think between now and next year's election, and then actually beyond next year's election, we are going to see a heightened level of implied volatility, not necessarily dramatically, not like 50% or 70% higher, but maybe as much as maybe as much as two, three, you know, 5% higher, which means, which means if you, if you translate that into opportunity, it's about 20 to 25% more opportunity in 2020. Well, actually from now until, you know, the end of 2020, than we saw in all of 2019. In 2019, we had a um, uh, contracting volatility all year, and there were not very many spikes in volatility. So it was tough to find kind of um, individual pockets of incredible opportunity. Opportunity is the inverse of fear. It's the inverse of uncertainty, and it's measured by implied volatility. And again, I'll say that one more time, just so it's clear. Opportunity is the inverse of fear and uncertainty. But the cool thing is fear and uncertainty drives opportunity. And it's all measured by implied volatility. And implied volatility in a traditional sense was always measured by the VIX or the VIX futures. On this platform, I just moved my cursor to the VIX futures. And you can see here, they closed up a little bit today, but they closed at, um, you know, let's say 1525. This is the VIX futures right here. And 1525 in the VIX futures in the start of a new cycle is a little bit below the norm. So the norm would be probably about 18. So it's about 20% below the norm for volatility. That's right around kind of the, the mean volatility level for, for VIX futures. The mean level for volatility, which is VIX, which I'll show you in a second. Um, the mean level for volatility is about 15. So it's currently 1278. So the difference here is that the VIX, VIX at the top of the page represents future volatility. It represents volatility out in December, um, 27 days from now. And forward slash, um, uh, forward slash VX, which is the volatility future, it's just a little lesson in volatility, represents the spot market in volatility, which is volatility today. In 27 days, these two numbers will be the exact same thing. But today, this represents volatility as of today, and the VIX represents volatility 27 days from now. So they're both about 20% lower than their mean. And that's important to know because unlike price, volatility is mean reverting. So again, unlike the price of just as an example, and I'll use Apple here, unlike the price of Apple, which is trading for 263, Apple is not mean reverting. So the fact that it was 245 after its last earnings came out, you know, just two and a half weeks ago, and now it's trading 263, almost $20 higher, does not mean it's going back to 245. But the VIX trading at, at uh, 15 and a quarter is mean reverting because the VIX is just a math equation. And so fear by definition and uncertainty by definition is mean reverting. And at some point it will go higher. Apple is, is based on price, has no reason to go lower. These are all just like little takeaways. And if you've never heard, if you've never heard me talk before, this is a big part of our discussion, which is and I'm treating this as if, you know, obviously there's people on here that have never, never heard a Tom talk or never heard, you know, the stuff that we talk about at Tasty Trade and the stuff that kind of, you know, I preach and promote about trading just because 
this will give you some strong fundamental know-how. Um, and, and I think it's important to understand price does not mean reverting, volatility is mean reverting. Well, one of the things that we've done on, on Tastyworks, Tasty Trade is our network, Tastyworks is our platform. And one of the things that we've done on Tastyworks, which is our brokerage firm and our platform is, we've defined implied volatility by using something called IV rank. So even before we get to a quote up here on the top line, we give you IV rank, which in the case of implied, which in the case of Apple is 20. And if we looked at some other stocks, like just to use an example of a stock that's been moving around a lot, Roku, the IV rank is 34. Now, you'd probably say, what's the difference between 34 and 20? Well, on a scale of one to 100, and remember, this, this all, all volatility is mean reverting. On a scale of one to 100, Roku is in the 34th, is, is, is ranked at the 34th. So between one and 100, it's ranked at 34. Apple's ranked at 20. For stocks that are IV rank over 30, this is the number up here, and we're the only platform that shows this at the top of the platform. Um, with the IV rank over 30, volatility is going to contract. It's just a math formula. Volatility is going to contract over time, which means there's going to be embedded contraction in there, which is good to know based on the strategy you're going to set up. If I went back to Apple, um, if I went back to Apple, in Apple, the volatility rank is 20. At 20, there is no edge in volatility contraction. So at 20, if the IV rank is 20, volatility does not necessarily have to contract. And in fact, in most cases, you're going to have what we call a little bit of negative edge. And there is a more realistic chance that volatility will expand a little bit and not contract. Therefore, premium selling strategies in Apple are not as attractive right now. Let me give you an example. If the IV rank is 20 or below and you wanted to trade Apple, one of the things that you're probably not going to do here is I'm going to open up December options. Let me just make this real simple for you so you can see. One of the things you're not going to do with the IV rank at 20 is you're not going to sell premium. So for example, if you wanted to sell as, as just an example, you want to sell a, a one standard deviation strangle in Apple and like sell the 15, the 16 Delta call and the 16 Delta put. Oops, hold on, I put stock in here by accident. Hold on one second. If you wanted to sell the 16 Delta call and the 16 Delta put, which is a one standard deviation strangle 30, um, 30 days out, you would not do this with the IV rank at 20. So for example, if you want to take undefined risk, and, and by the way, we have no issue whatsoever with undefined risk. The dollar, the dollar of risk or the dollar value of risk when doing undefined option trades is actually a better use of capital than defined risk. But it just depends on you know, how much capital you have. Again, in the case of Apple here, this is not a candidate for, defined, for an undefined risk strangle. It's also, I'll move these up a couple strikes, and I will just create a really simple iron condor here. And in the case of Apple, because the IV rank is only 20, it is not a case for an iron condor either. So one of the first things to understand is you have to really have a, be able to put context around implied volatility. And if the implied volatility in Apple is so low that the, which is right here, by the way, 25, that the IV rank is only 20 with an expected move of $11 or $12 in the next um, 30 days, these are not good strategies for this particular period of time. If I went to Roku, If I go to Roku, on the other hand, open up December options, and I've got to open up a few more options here because Roku's a, um, a little bit more volatile stock. And I went to sell the one standard deviation strangle. So I sold the 195 calls. And on the put side, let's see, I'm going to sell the, I'm going to probably sell the 135 puts. So if I went to Roku to sell the one standard deviation strangle in this case, I'd be collecting a lot more money, obviously, 525, because the implied volatility in Roku is 66. That's why you have a stock that's, that's $100 cheaper than Apple, but you're collecting almost three times as much money. And since the implied volatility rank is over 30, this is absolutely a doable strategy in Roku. Now, if for whatever reason you didn't have as much available capital and you wanted to turn this into an iron condor, you just roll the strikes up a little bit. I mean, it's obviously your choice. And you can create a five, oops, I'm sorry, did that wrong. You can create a $5 wide iron condor 
and this is a $5 wide counter, short the 175, 180 call spread and the 145, 140 put spread. And in this example here, it is absolutely a candidate for an iron condor because the IV rank is over 30. So I just looked at two stocks and they're both in play. Apple and Roku are both in play. Apple has an implied volatility rank of 20, which makes undefined risk trades like strangles and defined risk trades like iron condors not interesting to us at that implied volatility level. Roku, on the other hand, has an IV rank of 30, over 30, 34.2. So selling an iron condor in there or selling a undefined risk strangle are both attractive strategies to us. And again, in the mix of putting lots of positions on, the key here is trade small, trade often, and, you know, and put, and, and, and trade small, trade often, and put trades on that fit mechanically into the, um, with, or live within the context of whatever the current implied volatility rank is. Now, if you said to me, okay, but I really want to trade Apple, I don't want to trade Roku. I'm like, okay, that's cool. So we'll go back to Apple. So what are some of the types of trades that we can make in Apple um, with the IV rank where it is right now? And the answer is there's a couple of different things. So for low IV rank, I'll clear these trades. And for low IV rank, we can do a couple of different things. First of all, if you are, if you are bearish in Apple, one of the things you can do is you can buy the 265 puts, you can sell the 260 puts. And in this example here, um, you're just buying a put debit spread, buying one strike in the money, selling one strike out of the money. That is absolutely fine for an IV rank of 20. Um, if you wanted to make it a little bit bigger and buy a seven and a half dollar wide spread or a $10 wide spread, just you just drag it. That's why this platform is so beautiful for option trading and it's so easy to trade options on. You just drag it and you, there's never any clicks you have to make and everything defaults to mid price and all the price discovery is done, you know, is done for you. And if you wanted to route this order, you just double click on it. That's it. And it will pop up. Oops, let me put working orders here. It'll pop up into your working order column. If you want to cancel it or change the price, you just hit cancel order and it's gone. That's high frequency. That's high. That's a high frequency platform and there's nothing else like it, but it's super simple. So again, low implied volatility rank, you want to get short Apple. There's a couple different ways. A, you could sell the stock. That's totally fine. That's what we call a static play, but it's very expensive. B, you can buy a put spread and a put debit spread. That's another way. C, you can counterize something in here. So for example, let's just say, and I'll just open up a fewer strikes so you can see this. You wanted to do a DSJAN calendar spread and you were a little bit bearish in Apple. You could buy, um, you could sell the 255 puts in December and you can buy the 255 puts in, um, in January. And that's about as cheap as you're ever gonna see a calendar spread, a put calendar spread in Apple for $2.28. Now you're probably kind of a little bit wondering, well, where could this spread kind of go to? And the answer is it could probably go to about three and a half dollars based on where the puts are currently trading in December. So there's definitely an opportunity here to make, you know, I don't know, a buck, buck and a half if you like this counter spread with reasonable, reasonably low risk reward. But if you wanted to change this and make it into a diagonal, these are also trades that are absolutely appropriate for low implied volatility rank. So if you wanted to make it into a bearish diagonal, you would lower, you drag the, um, the short strike down one, and this is a long put spread. If you wanted to make it a bullish diagonal, because you were actually a little bit bullish in, in Apple, you would drag it up the other way and go from 255 to 257 or 260, and that's a bullish diagonal. So, so different strategies that meet the criteria for low implied volatility rank would be static, Delta, which is just buying or selling the stock, a debit spread, if you're bullish, a call debit spread, one strike in the money, one strike out of the money. And if you're bearish, a put debit spread, one strike, one strike in the money, you buy, one strike out of the money, you sell. Or you can do a one or two month calendar using the same strike, selling the front month, somewhere around the 35 or 40 Delta is fine. And then, or I usually do the I usually do the 30 or 35 delta, and then, and then you buy the next month out. And if you want to diagonalize that, you diagonalize it by moving the front month option higher or lower, depending on if you want to give it a little bullish delta or a little bearish delta. What's interesting here is this is a regular calendar spread. 
And when we look at a regular calendar spread, it's going to carry a tiny little bit of short delta. But if I wanted to make it a little bit more bullish, you can see I can turn the deltas long. And if I wanted to make it, oh, you know what? I should change the quantity here so this makes it more sense to everybody. So this is a regular calendar spread. Just there's only one lot so you can see it. So it's a regular calendar spread. It has, it has a tiny little bit of short delta to it, four deltas, which is the equivalent of four shares of Apple. If I wanted to make this spread, um, if I wanted to make this spread neutral, I drag the, I drag the puts up one. If I wanted to make it a little bullish, I drag the short puts up another one, and now I'm long six deltas. If I wanted to make it a little bit more bearish, I drag the short side down one, and now instead of being short four deltas, it's short eight deltas. And that is how you adjust your trades. And that is how you strategically apply low implied volatility rank stocks. Now, one of the neat things about this platform is it, the platform actually lets you easily search for um, high implied volatility stocks. Like I have it high, this is IV rank on the market watch, on the, uh, um, on the watch list page. So I'm searching right here for high implied volatility rank. And if I click it twice, I get to low implied volatility rank. So I could see all the stocks with low implied volatility. So if I want to do something either static directional, calendar, diagonal, or debit spreads, I would look at this list. And if I wanted to do something and I wanted to look like and find stocks that, that are candidates for um, short strangles, straddles, um, iron condors, I'd look at this list. So at the top of this list here is a stock Apache with an IV rank of 100. So we're going to go to Apache for a sec. And all you do on this platform is just click on anything. There's, you never have to type in anything if you don't want to. And the beautiful thing is there's no pages. It never takes you to a different page. You never get lost in a platform. It's everything's right in front of you all the time. So I just typed on Apache. The stock is trading at closed at uh, 2287, but the IV rank is 100. The difference between IV rank at one and IV rank at 100 is almost 11 times more opportunity. I know it sounds crazy, but it's 11x the opportunity of zero to 100, which sounds nuts, but that's how much it is. So if you went to December in Apache because of the high implied volatility rank and you wanted to sell the nearest out of the money call, it'd be the 23 and the nearest out of the money put would be the 22 and a half. And this is a $3 strangle, which is wrapped around at the money. If you remember, the strangle that we looked at in Apple with a 20% implied volatility rank was almost, was just a little bit over $3. As crazy as that sounds, that's a $260 stock. This is a $23 stock because of the high implied volatility, 67, and because of the IV rank being virtually 100. Now, if you said, you know what, I don't, I'm uncomfortable with this naked position, so I want to do something and like make it into like, let's just say an iron fly, for example, here you go. Now you have an iron fly and let's say, or this is actually, I take this back. This would be your iron fly, 23, 24, 20. Um, oh no, no, I take this right here, 23, 24. There you go. That would be your iron fly. And so that's almost like a perfect iron fly. If you wanted to make this into an iron condor, a little bit more of an iron condor, you just drag these and you can have, here's a, here's a one and a half dollar wide. Um, there's a one and a half dollar wide iron condor or you can make it more equidistant and do it this way. Or you can skew it up and down and see, you know, again, you can move it any which way you want. This is delta neutral right here. If you want to make it, if you want to make a little bit long, because you were bullish for whatever reason in Apache, um, you just drag the strikes up a little bit, make it a little bit more long. Want to make it even longer? Um, you just drag the stock strikes up. Now you're long five deltas. If you wanted to make it even longer, you can tighten up the put spread. And so there's all these different things you can do and on the platform makes it super simple, but all of these qualify for a high IV rank. Now, I just threw a ton. That was a lesson like of, that was a, that was a 20 hour course, 20 hour graduate course thrown into about 20 minutes here. So I'm gonna give you a chance to, to, to breathe for a second. And um, uh, Fausto, I'm gonna just, I'm going to ask you to hop on for one second, make sure that everybody's cool because I haven't been reading any of the chats or messages. Make sure we haven't lost anybody and that this is exactly the direction that you, um, that you want me to go. No, no, Tom, I follow, I, I, I'm following along with you very well. I mean, uh, the, the only difference is that 
some of us traders, you know, you know, my trade specifically, we don't trade very expensive stocks, you know, being a day trader, like, sure. like right now, I don't know if you've been watching it. Um, Uber just took off. I don't know what news must've came out. You know, I mean, I own the stock. I just bought it at the last hour. So maybe you could kind of bring up and show them what, what an Uber, you know, option play would be on that one. If there's something out there. Sure. Sure. Let's talk Uber for a second. So Uber is a little bit different. So I happen to be, um, I happen to be long a little Uber myself. Um, uh, I'm long some stock. I have a few option plays on in there. And um, uh, in fact, in this account, we have on a, uh, this is a bull, slightly bullish um, put ratio spread, long one, short three. And it's a kind of a classic little bit of a bullish, you know, Uber play. Uber does not have an implied volatility rank because Uber is a new issue and it doesn't have a hundred days of history yet. I mean, I'm sorry, it doesn't have a one year of history yet. So it doesn't have a true IV rank at this time. But Uber and Lyft are definitely both in play. Now, there's a couple things that, you know, we should talk about with respect to Uber and how you know it's in play and how you know it's liquid. Number one is it traded 51 million shares today. Anything that trades 51 million shares automatically is a good stock for stock trading, good stock for day trading, good stock for option trading. It's plenty liquid enough. Second thing is during the day, the, op, the stock market in, in Uber is about a penny wide. So right now it's a nickel wide because that's after hours market. But during the day to day, um, Uber is size up only about a penny wide. So it's definitely a tradable stock. Also, when you go to the options, you can see, and this is what determines liquidity. But as long as there's, you know, there's 7,000 of the 27 calls traded, 1,300 of the 28 calls and, and 800 of these puts traded. So when you look at the volume, of the options trading in December. There's plenty of December options trading. So there is absolutely Uber's tradable. Also, when you look at the markets in here, the Uber always shows markets in nickel wide instruments, but the spreads trade in pennies. So if you're looking to do something in Uber, I mean, obviously like Fausto just mentioned, Uber is definitely a stock that you can, as a, um, as a, as, 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 a, as somebody wants to trade or day trade or do whatever, you can definitely do that with Uber because it is liquid and it is, um, it's plenty liquid and it's inexpensive, I guess, at, at you know, 28 or $29. The option marketplace is uh, the spreads trade in pennies. The individual options trade kind of in nickels. I think they can fill inside of that, but they don't have to. And the nice thing about it is it has half point strikes too. So 27, 27 and a half, 28, 28 and a half, 29, 29 and a half and 30. So there's plenty of stuff to do. Uber is one of those stocks that we consider every strategy because it doesn't have an IV rank. So every strategy is open to you at this point in Uber. There's no, you don't have to limit yourself, um, you know, to, to low IV ranks uh, strategies. Don't, you don't have to be high IV rank. It can be either one. You can pretty much run the whole gauntlet of anything you want to do. And the other thing with Uber is you probably, um, want to take a look when you're when you're trading uber you also kind of want to probably drop lyft into your watch list not that they move side by side in fact today lyft was down most of the day when uber was up most of the day oops what did i do here oops i did it wrong hold on ly i should know this because i have a bunch of lyft positions on um but as you can see here lyft was down today when uber was up so they don't necessarily always move in the same direction or, or the same way, but it is important to, to watch the two. Now, if you see the volume in Lyft at 8 million shares and Uber at 51 million, there's definitely a reason that Uber should be the default over Lyft, although the Lyft options are relatively liquid as well. Getting back to Uber for a second, I just want to show the comparison between those two because Uber just trades more than Lyft. It trades more volume every day. Then it trades a lot more volume every day than Lyft does. But what's available to you at Uber is, is virtually anything. So if you were looking at the fine risk trades in Uber, like uh, I'll just show you like some of the stuff that we do. If you're bullish in Uber here, I like the position that we have on in this account, which is a ratio spread, which is like long one at the money put. This is a typical trade that you put on for high implied volatility stocks, like long one at the money put short, um, two out of the money puts. I'll just put it here. Um, and it trades for about a 15 cent credit, this one by two. It's the synthetic equivalent of being short, like an out of the money put at the, let's say at the 25 and a half strike, it's about a 40 cent put you're short, theoretically. And so it's a very high probability trade. If you didn't like the idea of a ratio spread 
and you're bullish, Uber is definitely a stock where you can just sell a put spread. And it doesn't matter, you know, really what spread you sell. You want to sell the 20, uh, 28, 26, you know, you collect about one third the width of the strikes. That's pretty normal for a short um, credit spread on the put side. Um, if you didn't want to do either of those and you wanted to buy a call spread in Uber, like let's say you wanted to buy the 27 and a half calls and sell the 29 and a half calls, we'd be totally cool with that too. A $2 wide call spread, $1 in the money and trading for less than one half the width of the strikes, absolutely something that meets you know, all of our criteria. If you decided, okay, I want to do something that takes a little bit more risk than that and you wanted a little bit of bullish um, you want a little bit of bullish delta, let's say in Uber, we have no problem selling the 27 puts. And like, just as an example, like the, uh, let's just say the 30 calls. So this would be considered to be a skewed strangle where you're selling a little bit bigger put than you are a caller on, move this down, um, sorry, move this up a little bit to like here. So you can do it. So 27 puts, 31 calls. This would be an example of a skewed strangle, which would let you play the upside in Uber because you're selling a bigger put than a call. A couple things to note in Uber, which is you should always just take a quick look at the skew. So like Fausto talked about, um, just mentioned a second ago and talked a little bit about, um, you know, like Uber is in play. So something I want to show you about Uber, which is pretty interesting. If you look at the 30, the stock is trading for um, uh, the stock, we have to use closing prices. So the stock closed at $28, right where this line is, right at $28. If you go $2 up, the calls are 55.60. See that right here? Okay. And if you go $2 down, 28, the puts are 50.55. So what we call in this case is there is no volatility skew in Uber. So sometimes when you look at stocks, and I'll show you some examples in a second, but sometimes when you look at stocks, the calls are more expensive than the puts because the perception is that the velocity of risk in a certain stocks is to the upside. In Uber, there is no marketplace perception of risk. So in other words, they're valuing the calls and the puts risk-wise almost equally. So when Fausto says, what do you think about Uber here? Well, the marketplace is telling you that there is the perception of risk is about equal. When you look at something very different like spiders, which is the S&P 500, you're going to see huge downside put skew. So the spiders closed at just under one, just under, under 311. So if I go up to um, 315, the calls are $1.68, okay? Just, these are $4 higher. The puts, if I go $4 lower down to 307 or, or 306, it doesn't even matter. If I go down to 306 and go almost $5 lower, the calls are 274. So 168, Versus 274, the puts further out of the money are a dollar more expensive. The marketplace assesses what we call vol skew into the put side here. So the velocity of risk or the perception of risk in the S&Ps is to the downside. And going back to Uber for a second, there is no skew in there. The calls and the puts are virtually the same price. And when the calls and the puts are the same price, you end up in a situation where with no skew, so there's no perception of risk in Uber, which makes trading in it actually a little bit easier. And one of the cool things about Tastyworks is if this view confuses you at all, or just you think, hey, you know what, this is a little hard. We also give you a, 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 a curve view so you can see things in graphical format. There's a distribution curve here. These are one standard deviation and two standard deviation lines. And then you see you lose money down here, you lose money up here, and you make all this money in the green area in between. And then you can adjust your strikes by just dragging accordingly in here. So the platform is very, um, uh, is very easy to use. And it's also very visual for people that prefer a curve mode you know, um, to a table mode. I mean, I personally prefer the table mode, but that's because I'm used to looking at things up and down in vertical fashion. A lot of people really, especially people new to the trading business love the idea that we have a visual or curve mode because nobody else has that. And it gives you, you know, just different views. We also have an analysis mode. We also have an active mode, but those are, you know, things you can learn about at uh, future, at, at future times when you, when you log on. Did that answer your question, Fausto, about, um, about the, uh, you know, just in general about, uh, about Uber?
Oh, okay, I might have lost him, but hopefully, hopefully I didn't. Um, it's okay. Um, all right, I'm going to keep going then. A couple of other things to 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 note here, and I'm going to clear off Uber for a second, and I'm going to talk about just in general. I'm going to talk about markets because this today was today was interesting because it was the first day that we had any kind of a down day, and it, and at one point today we were actually down about 25 handles. We only closed down. 10 handles, so it's not that big a move. Um, but at least it's a little bit of a breakup of the monotony of the of the up move every single day. What we would like to see here, and what, what I'd like to see, is a lot more two-sided action because I'd like to get into a situation where there's where there's some heightened volatility. And when there's heightened volatility, what's really important is that you stay with liquid underlines. One of the neat things about Tastyworks is that we actually have a liquidity meter on the on the um, on the market watch page on the watch list page, so you can just choose liquidity as one of your drop downs, and then you can look at everything that has four star liquidity, because that will put you in a position where price discovery and um, where price discovery and the and the actual um, ability to get in and out of underlines is is right in front of you and is super important and you know what it is all the time. Also, one of the neat things that we do is we spend a lot of time talking about potentially different earnings plays. Now, one of the stocks that has earnings this afternoon was Macy's. And as you can see, the IV rank is 100. So that means that Macy's was, you know, there was the most, the most possible, as, as much as possible, uncertainty and fear in Macy's for their earnings overnight, which is a binary event. So Macy's, which is not probably the greatest earnings play in the world because it's only a $15 stock, at least it has a lot of premium. And you can see the volatility of Macy's is extremely high. A couple things to note about, about earnings plays. One is you can see the difference in volatility in the front month, December of 75, and in the back month of, of uh, January of 69. And then it drops off dramatically in February and May to about 58. One of the things that people ask us all the time is, how do I know where volatility is going to settle in tomorrow? How do I know if I sold December or if I sold January, where volatility is going to be in a couple of days? And if I sold something in one of these months or one of these weeklies, whatever it is, you know, how much money could I expect to make if the stock doesn't move? And how much could I expect to lose if the stock does move? So if you did a December position, the volatility here is 75 the chances of tomorrow, it's probably going to drop down into the low 60s or high 50s. So there's going to be a drop, a significant drop of, of almost 20% to 25% in implied volatility. That we can tell because the back months won't move. Also, this number here shows the expected move between now and November. I'm sorry, between now and December expiration, December 20th. So this is a really interesting thing because the stock is going to move about $2.41 between now and December expiration. Also, based on current implied volatility of, 70, of 75%, um, the expected one-day move in here is, and this is interesting, 19% volatility is about a 1% move in the underlying. So 75% implied volatility is about a 4% move in the underlying for one day move at, at a very minimum, just so you, you know this. If it's 60, it's about, um, it's, it's just about a 3% move. On a $15 stock, that means your average daily move in here, just to give you some context, with high implied volatility rank, your average daily moves gonna be between 45 and 60 cents at its current volatility levels. When, it, when volatility smooths out, it's gonna be about 45 cents a day. And knowing that, will allow you to, in stocks like Macy's, it doesn't have to be Macy's, but in stocks like Macy's, it will give you some context around what the daily expected move is and the implied volatility rank will give you the choice of many, many, many different strategies, especially with the implied volatility rank at 100. So what's important about this? What's important about the implied volatility rank of 100 in Macy's is if you mix that with the implied volatility of Apple at 20, and you do a, let's just say, a two month trade in Apple with 50, um, with, I think that says 58 days, with 58 days to go, and you do a Macy's trade with 30 days to go, you are mixing up, as I talked about earlier, you're mixing up 
the underlines, Macy's versus Apple. You're mixing up the duration, December versus January. You're mixing up the volatilities, 25 versus 70. And, and you're mixing up the strategies, hopefully a defined, like a debit spread in here or counter spread versus the Macy's trade, which is like, let's just say it would be a strangle or a straddle with the Ivy rank at 100. That is a lesson that very few people in this entire industry have ever, have ever really discussed at length. And it's a huge takeaway. And you can see it just from this slash Apple slash um, Apple slash um, Macy's thing. Let me just show you real quickly because I'm going to make this into a, um, this is a, let me do this real quick. I'm going to go to January. I'm going to buy the 265 puts. I'm going to sell the 255 puts. I'm going to buy this put spread and I'm going to put this order over here and then I'm going to go to Macy's and in Macy's, I'm going to open up December options. I'm going to sell the 15 straddle and I'm going to put this order in over here. Okay. Now I want to just review this because this is so cool. So, or it's cool to geeks like me. Um, these are two different underlines. That is one immediate source of diversification, two different underlines, two different um, industry sectors. It doesn't matter. They, they are, they are, they are not that highly correlated. This is two different durational cycles. This is December with 30 days. This is January with 58 days. That is what we call diversification. This is two different strategies, a short straddle and a long debit spread. That is your third level of diversification. So different underlines, different durations, different strategies. And the fourth level is different implied volatilities. Macy's 75, Apple 25. You cannot do any better doesn't matter about you know being you're not you're never going to know direction you you know nobody knows what's going to happen next what we do know though is we can be as mechanical as possible and put things into place that give us the best chance of success if we do it enough times and here is a absolutely perfect example of how to accomplish that hey um tom let me ask you a question because i was looking at macy's and i like macy's a lot it got destroyed um if I want to do a leap play, here's a chart of Macy's. Just you're yeah, absolutely right. It's been destroyed. Yeah, and if, but if you go back like two years, three years, like if you could show Charlotte a little bit further. Yeah, sure. You'll, I mean, if you like, I said, if you go back, you'll see. Uh, is that no? It's further than that. Yeah, no, just the, go. You're, you're in nine, 2019. You got to go like like yeah. you got it. I know, I know. I, 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 I hear. Let me see if I can pull this back here. There you go. Yeah, you uh, can, you can see when you go back, like the 18, like November, and like right well, there, it's a perfect here, spot right two, there. You like see this, November, if right you go there. Back to, this is 2017, right here, and it's up around 40 ish. But if you go to 2018, um, that's the high of 2018, and so it's up around. Yeah, it's still in the 40s. Right, but if you go back to November, like where you were in 18, it hit. It was there before, right around this price, and it went back up. So for me, looking at this, it because it, obviously you know you it's go, Christmas right time. Here. Yeah, it's Christmas time. People are gonna spend money, and it's obviously earnings. Obviously, you nobody's know, spending money. So if we, you know, I, I think it's probably a pretty pretty decent. I mean, you know better than me how you would trade as an option. So if somebody didn't want to swing trade this, let's say you did like a leap on it. Well, uh, there, there's a couple ways to do it if you wanted to play it kind of as a swing trade. First of all, you'd go to January here because the IB ranks so high and you'd sell like the 14 or the 13 puts naked because if you sell the 13 puts naked and you, let's just say you got 85 cents for them, you'd be buying the stock at 12.15 if the stock went down. And I think that that's a number you'd be very comfortable with buying stock at 12.15. So if you sold these puts naked and I should be, I should tell you that in a Tastyworks account, whether it's, it doesn't matter to us, whether it's an IRA account or individual margin account or portfolio margin account, we support stock options, futures, and naked options in all three. So we're one of the only firms that allows you to sell naked options in an IRA account, puts and calls, and same thing with futures and futures options in an IRA account, puts and calls. So that's really important to know. But I would sell like, for example, these 13 puts at 85 cents, and then for January, and it's a high return on capital. 
and you'd be buying stock if the stock went down to 1215, you know, by January expiration, I think that that's totally reasonable buying the stock, you know, $3 lower or 20% lower than where it's currently trading. If you wanted a leap strategy, we would go with what you call a poor man's covered call. So in a leap strategy here, Fausto, we would go to the um, February options. I wouldn't go beyond February. Okay. Um, I wouldn't go beyond February. And if we were doing February, I'd buy probably the February 13 or 14 calls. And then I would sell a near term like December, like 16 call. And that's what we call a poor man's covered call. You buy a long term option like the December, like the February 14s and you sell the December um, for you sell like the December 16s. And that's what we would do. Okay. And that's, that's the equivalent of a covered call, but with only a dollar 39 in risk. Okay. And that's how we play the upside. You, you know, it's, it, it can go significantly high. It can go over $2 and it's just, um, it's how we would play it. Now, one last thing uh, for everybody to know, because sometimes um, people want to do, uh, well, two things. I, I saw some of the, I saw your staff answering some of the questions. You know, we, we train a lot. You and I have been in Canada so many times. Someone was asking you, you're going to be in Canada by next year, I heard. Is that what they said? Yes, 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 absolutely. Okay, so that's going to be really huge. Now, the thing is, if somebody wanted just to trade the stock off the, pl the platform, how can they just buy the stock and not just do the option play? Well, also, just so you know, so like, like, like all the other brokers, stock trading on Tastyworks is free. So let's just say you want to buy Macy's, right? It's so easy. You just type in Macy's or you have it in your watch list. You just click on the offer. That's it. And then just hit review and send. You know, so you just double click on this and then there's your buy. Um, and if you, you know, like, uh, um, what time is it? It's, oh, we... Um, we just turned off the after hours trading at four o'clock. Otherwise I could have shown it, shown it to you, but, um, that's how you do it. You just, if you want to sell a stock, just click on the bid like this. If you want to buy a stock, just click on the offer like this. And that's all there is to it. Okay. Sell and is that a limit order or a market order? Those, everything we do is limit orders. If you want to change it to a, a marketable limit order, you can, I mean, we offer market orders, but it's not a default. The default is limit. It's always limit. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. we do that to protect the customer. No, I hear you. Could you trade pre-market and aftermarket on the platform? Yep. yep. You can trade an hour before and an hour after. And it's, Perfect. And, and everything's free. I mean, I'm sorry. All the stock trading's free. Option trading, we charge a dollar to open, zero to close, and we cap everything at $10. So if you trade a 50 lot or a 100 lot, it's capped at $10. So it's, it's the best, we have, I believe, the lowest rates on the street for options, among the lowest rates for futures, and obviously stocks are free, so you can't go any lower than that. All right, great, great. All right, so how does how everybody get a, um, a demo, or how can they practice so, the platform? How do you guys do that to explain to them? So we have something that you guys are going to really like. We have a, um, something that we're, we're called, we call the trading challenge right now. And if anybody wants to try out the platform, um, you can go to our, uh, we have a, a site which we'll post up. I'll actually ask Scott and uh, uh, Ryan and Chris to post the site right now for our trading demo. And we have something which we call trading challenge. And we'll give you $5,000. And for two days, you can trade stock on the platform. You get, you get 48 hours during the market hours. And you can trade stock. We've been running this now for about, probably the last four or five months, um, this, this, this promotion. And you can trade stock on the platform for two days. It's a virtual account, but, and you keep all the money you make up to $250 and you can't lose. You know, we eat the losses. And so you get 48 hours, 5,000 bucks, you keep all the money you, you can make and we will um, credit your account that money when you open an account. So you get a chance to check out the platform and, um, and if you make any money, you can keep it. We've given away, you know, tens and tens and probably hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's crazy. But um, um, you can get a chance to check out the platform that way. And uh, so, you know, you can log on, just play around with it. And, um, and, and you know, just you can see what happens. See, see how you like it. It's an amazing platform. For trading stocks, it is one of the best platforms in the industry. It's just so damn simple. You just click on whatever it is. If you wanted to trade Apple, for example, you just click, click on your watch list. It pops it in. You just double click on review and send and you're done. No, I mean, listen, I, 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 you did this last time you told everybody about it. You just launched it that time when we did the last event. I mean, oh, okay, good. You, 
Where yeah. could you actually or get an account? And, and you know, and I know, we, I tell this all the time. Like I was, I, I just came, uh, I did an event in Vegas the other, you know, uh, a few months ago and people are always asking me and they'll, you know, they're, they've been on training mode. I'm like, well, how long have you been training for? Oh, you know, about a year. I'm like a year. How do you pay your bills? I'm like, listen, you got to trade with real money. It's the only way you're going to learn. And you know, everybody wants to demo everyone's platform, but when you get a live account and you're taking the losses and you're doing that, I mean, what's better than that? And trust me, it's a, everybody. It's a, it's a lot. It's a big difference when you got real money on the line. And then with someone else's money, I mean, it's better than that. And you have it for two days. I mean, you really know if it's for real or not. Yeah. You just go to, to tastyworks.com forward slash challenge. And that's it. Okay. Tastyworks.com forward slash challenge. And then you just have to, you know, you just have to put a use, you have to create a username and password. You download the software and you click on a couple of buttons and boom, you're live. And then you get two days to, to play around with it. You also get us, if you open an account and fund it before um, December 31st, you're going to get a subscription to the small exchange for free. It's, uh, it's our new futures exchange that we're launching uh, at the end of this year. And um, we will not be offering that promotion in 2020. So um, uh, it's a it's a hundred dollar you know exchange membership. So I uh, exchange uh, subscription. So it's super cool. So you get that as well, in addition to all the money that you can um, you know keep from the trading challenge. So it's very cool. <laughs> That's great, it's great. Well, Tom, um, anyone could you trade cryptocurrency trading on it? That was a cool question. Um, only the only the futures right now. So. If you wanted to trade, for example, the Bitcoin future right now, um, there's no options available yet. They'll be coming in January, February, according to the CME. But yes, you can trade the CME product, which is right up, you know, which is, which will open in, it opens at five o'clock tonight, but you can trade the Bitcoin futures. We don't offer cash Bitcoin, but we will next year. So it's coming in the first quarter. You'll be able to trade uh, the spot market for digital currencies. You'll be, I think we're going to offer, um, four or five currencies in the spot marketplace, but we don't get that many requests. Most people that want to trade it, trade a little, trade the futures up here, but whatever, we're going to offer the spot market in the first quarter of 2020. Good. All right, Tom, just one last question I have for you to repeat what uh, you said earlier, as so everybody knows. So your project, your projection uh, prediction is stock market's going to go higher even after the election. Is it a matter who's going to be elected or more or less, you know, just feel very bullish about the whole thing with China and everything. That was not my prediction whatsoever. I'm, I'm not sure where you got that, but that is absolutely not my prediction. I believe that the stock market, we, I believe that we are in the tail end of a very long, prolonged bull market. Um, I believe we were grossly, grossly oversold in 2008, 2009, and I, I was very vocal about that at the time. Um, I think we've spent the last decade or 11 years you know, working out of that oversold condition, and we are into an extremely overbought condition right now. I think there is not necessarily a reason for us to go down in 2020, but there is not a healthy risk reward for staying long. So I think that 2020 is going to be a year for the opportunist. I think 2020 is going to be a year that individual investors can take advantage of heightened implied volatility, that there's going to be, it's going to be the year that the strategic investor, that the trader, um, shines and not the passive investor, but I think that we're in for some, I don't think we're, I don't think we're crashing. I don't think we're going to have a huge massive sell off or any of that kind of stuff, but I do think that we're in for, um, we're in for probably one to two years of at least distributing this massive move over the last 10 or 11 years. And I would think that you're going to see, um, you know, potentially some kind of a nice pullback. We did not have a single volatility expansion that's significant in 2019. And we didn't have a single sell-off in 2019. We had two massive sell-offs in 2018. I doubt that we're going to go through 2020 without some significant um, selling pressure at different points. So I think you're going to see a much more volatile market. I wouldn't be surprised to see us go into the elections, you know, um, a couple hundred points lower, a couple hundred points higher than where we are right now. But my guess is it'll be a couple hundred points lower. And then we'll see what happens, um, you know, as we get through um, 2020. I, I do expect it to be a great year for traders. I think the bias, the, my bias is to the downside, but I believe that the 
real risk is dramatically to the downside. So I think that the velocity of risk and the, and the true pot odds are downside. Yeah, I, I think the same thing. I, I, I was with you that uh, agree, totally agree with you. You know, d depending on what happens with, uh, you know, like you got unemployment at the low, I mean, how much low could it go? Interest rates are at the lowest. Um, everybody's working. I mean, that, and you, you, you're plateauing. Only thing you could probably push this mark a little bit higher if you get this China deal. But then after that, what's left? You know what I mean? But I think anything that would scare the market, I think will make a massive sell off more than, a, than more of a massive gain. That's exactly um, what I, that's exactly how I feel. That's how I feel. All right. Well, Tom, listen, thank you so much for being here. Uh, everybody that's, uh, let's thank Tom for, for uh, taking the opportunity to, to be here. I and mean, he's probably exhausted working all day, but uh, Tom, it's always been a pleasure and uh, just always like to have you on. It's, uh, you know, it's always, it was just a great educational class and great platform. Everybody do, go out there and try that, uh, that, that two day, platform and see what it's all about and get to get the opportunity to enjoy that see what the trading is uh but most important before you do that just make sure you practice and see what you're doing um but uh you can't beat that you can't beat that deal tom thank you so much and uh look forward to seeing you in the upcoming events everybody thanks everybody if i don't speak to you have a happy thanksgiving and i uh, hope you enjoy your 2019 and have a great 2020 thanks everybody